Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. What do I want out of a perfect roast chicken? I want that crackling brown skin that's as salty as a potato chip. I want dark meat that's falling off the bone and white meat that's juicy and tender. It's just a matter of learning a few super simple techniques because once you have those down, it's easy. And I mean, throw it together on a weeknight easy. This is Melissa Clark and my recipe for perfect roast chicken is at nytcooking.com. NYT Cooking has you covered with recipes, advice, and inspiration for any occasion. Welcome back to Not Another Mummy Podcast with me, Alison Perry. There is no denying that the conversation around race and activism is starting to slowly change. World events and movements like Black Lives Matter are hitting the headlines and entering into our everyday discussion between friends in a way that they weren't before. My guest today is a huge contributor to that conversation as one half of the anti-racism Instagram account, Everyday Racism. Along with her sister, Natalie, Naomi Evans shares stories and educational posts focusing on how to be anti-racist. Naomi talks today about how they decided to start the platform after a video of Natalie went viral on Twitter when she confronted two men racially abusing a ticket conductor. We also talk about how to discuss social injustice with our kids and how to raise them as people who care about others, show empathy and how to guide them to do something about the injustice that we see around us. Please do check out their Instagram account, Everyday Racism. It is so useful and may well help enrich your understanding of the anti-racism work that we all need to be doing. And hopefully my chat with Naomi today will be a good taster of the work that they do. Welcome, Naomi. It is so lovely to have you join me today. How are you doing today? Oh, thanks, Alison. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. And we should say that um, Natalie was going to be joining us, but she's feeling a bit poorly, isn't she? She was. She's got an awful migraine. Mm. So I'm representing both of us. And we're sending get well wishes to Natalie, aren't we? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, So tell me a little bit about, I mean, I'm guessing that, you know, the majority of people listening will have, should have come across everyday racism on Instagram. Um, but tell us a little bit about, about about how it started because it was it was a, a video that went viral that Natalie posted on social media, wasn't it, in May 2020? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Natalie was, and she's my sister as well, um, was involved in an incident on a train where she witnessed. Um, some racist abuse being directed at the ticket conductor. And she wasn't sure sort of how to intervene. So she started to film it in case the ticket conductor wanted some evidence. And as she started to film, she realised that she needed to say something and she couldn't just be a bystander. So she ended up um, confronting the two men that were racially abusing the ticket conductor. And it actually turned out, um, you know, not not too bad in the sense that it didn't end in any sort of violence or altercation. Um, And then she kind of, she left it. She rang me after it happened and told me because she was quite shaken up and upset about it. Um, but she didn't do anything with the video. She just said to the ticket conductor, if you, if you want it, then I can send it to you. But after the murder of Ahmad Aubrey a couple of years ago, um, she decided that she would actually put that, well, it was actually a friend of hers asked if they could put the video on social media because a lot of people were, talking about racism under that narrative of isn't it terrible what happens in America and so she was kind of feeling like do people not realize that we have lots of racism in the UK and you know we talked about 
um, doing something under the heading everyday racism before and um, something to do with education but we hadn't really got round to setting everything up and the video went out and it went viral and we were living together at the time and and as this video got passed around we were watching it all sort of unfold and reading the comments and there were things like you know it's amazing that she stood up and said something and other people were saying, oh, isn't it terrible? Um, I can't believe this happens. And we were just like, I think this is the time. I think people are perhaps ready to have this conversation. Um, and we thought, how can we, you know, start a forum where people can share their experiences in a bit of a safe, safe space um, and we thought that setting up an Instagram page would probably be that we weren't on Twitter and we weren't on Facebook. So an Instagram page might be the way to go. Yeah. So, yeah, that's when we started Everyday Racism. I mean, yeah, and it's just flown ever since, hasn't it? It's just it's been incredibly successful. Um, I mean, if Natalie was here, I would be asking her about how she felt that day because mm. I can imagine it was probably running through her head. Yes, like you said, it didn't end up being, you know, um, particularly, I mean, it was fairly aggressive, but it didn't get violent. It didn't get yeah. dangerous, but she didn't know that at the time. She didn't know what these no. two guys, you know, uh, what really, what state of mind they were in. Um, she already knew that they were racist. And here she is a mixed race woman challenging them and she was quite forthright with what she with, with, with how she challenged them and she was quite persistent she didn't let them kind of yeah you know get out get get you know away with it easily um that might that must have been I mean did she chat to you about it afterwards how, how terrified was she yeah she rang me straight after and she was really shaken up um but I think what had happened really was that we had both got to a place where we were just becoming increasingly more frustrated with incidents. I mean, we grew up in a very white majority area um, in a part of Kent where UKIP were very prevalent. Um, Nigel Farage spent a lot of time in our hometown trying to drum up support. Um, and we had grown up with quite a lot of racism around us and microaggressions um, from people around us. And I think over the years, it's just built up and up to the point where I think after particularly reading why I no longer talk to white people about race, um, we were both like, yeah, finally, this is something we can really relate to. Um, and just increasingly frustrated with having to put up with things and not feeling like we could say something um, without it ending up being really awkward for us and really difficult for us. And so I kind of feel like it for Natalie, it got to a point where that frustration kind of came out. Mm. It was like an adrenaline and it all kind of came out in one go. And, sh and although it was, it was really scary and she was, you know, it wasn't easy. It kind of had to be done. And for us, it's been a real process of, um, healing and also processing things that have happened in our upbringing that's brought us to this point today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned earlier that when the video was published, there was reactions from people that were like, we can't believe this happens. Does that frustrate you? Because I, I see that a lot on social media. You know, a mm. black person shares their experience or an experience of someone else. And people like myself, you know, white people come along and very well-meaningly say, oh my goodness, I'm so shocked. I cannot believe this happens. And I imagine that must feel quite frustrating. Yeah, I think <laughs> it, it can be because you, when you've grown up with racism and you understand how it operates and how it shows up, you're just like, well, this isn't, this isn't shocking at all. Like I completely expect this and preempt it and I can sense when it's going to happen. Um, so for people to 
say, you know, wow, this is shocking. You know, it just highlights how um, unaware I think people have been. I think it's like feels slightly different now. There's been a, a shift, um, obviously, because we're talking about race in such an open way in this country in a way that I've never, I've never seen before. Um, in, you know, publicly in the media, I think people feel a bit more empowered to talk more openly, but you do still get, you know, the response of, I can't believe it. And I think we need to move past that kind of um, I mean, it's important to be outraged. I mean, of course, yes. you know, you don't want to just accept these things. But I think um, you can you can you can sympathise with someone without expressing shock, yeah, can't you? Absolutely. I also think that it, it's probably you know you you used the word microaggression earlier, and I think that that kind of sums up a lot of the problem. Is that these these acts, these comments, these looks, they're so tiny mm. that to a lot of people who aren't looking out for it, they're not, you know, it, it doesn't make a difference to their day whether people are displaying racist microaggressions. So they're not going to pick up on these tiny things, but they're huge. No, and they're also massive. they're not directed at them no, either. Yeah. So they're not, they're not going to sense um, what it feels like to be othered. Mm. Um in that way. But I think, yeah, certainly the microaggressions are the most common ever when we talk about that everyday racism. That is the way. Obviously, there's the bigger things as well, but that's the way that it, it shows up most commonly. And like you say, it can seem like it's small. So when you talk about an isolated incident, it can almost feel like, oh, you know, just you need to just forget about it or just move on it's not a big deal but when those things build up over time then of course um they're gonna have an impact um and it's really difficult sometimes to explain so even though you know what it is and you completely sense it explaining to somebody else that doesn't experience it can also be very difficult. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you said that we, we've, that we're discussing race and racism a lot more. But with that comes the flip side where you've got certain newspapers and, you know, media outlets um, almost like ramping up the kind of the snowflake conversation, the woke conversation. And, mm. you know, that word woke has become layered with so many different interpretations. <laughs> I know. I find it absolutely hilarious, actually. It's baffling. The way people use woke as some sort of insult because I'm like, well, first of all, do you know, even know the origin of the word um, and what it means? And it's related to social injustice. Yes. So you're basically saying that, if you're woke, you, you're aware of the way injustice affects and prejudice affects other people. Well, I think that that's a, that's a compliment, you know. Like how could that ever that be I a was, bad thing? Yeah. Um, but it's been twisted and it's been, it's completely used as, as an insult now. Um, and that, like you say, the snowflake kind of comment. And I just think, you know, I, I laugh about it because I'm like, well, actually, I do care about other people yeah. and I, I am interested in making sure other people feel included and, you know, and comfortable. So <laughs> if that's an insult, then yeah. I'll take it. Bring it on, bring it on. That's all good. Um, okay, so let's talk about you and your sister and activism. Um, when would you say that you first consider yourselves as being activists? Were you quietly challenging the world around you when you were young, growing up in a white majority area in Kent? Yeah, I think so. I don't think we've ever really labelled ourselves activists. We never really carried that title um, or applied it to ourselves, um, although I'm perfectly fine with with it. Um but our mum really had a big influence on us. She has always, um, even her profession, she's a social worker, but also outside of that, she's always campaigned for different things. So I think we've seen her doing that as just part of her everyday life. And I think that that had an impact on us. We just kind of were like, that's just what you do. You just, 
you just fight for the things that you believe in. And she had to do that a lot for us growing up. She had to advocate for us. We had a lot of incidents in school and she was um, that parent that would, you know, come come to the school to challenge things. Um, and we saw her um, protesting. She, You know, we had posters in our window for different things and she was, you know, raising money for things. She's always... So I think we had that modelled for us. Um, and our dad as well has always been interested in politics and social justice. So I think it came from our family. Um, but yeah, we have always been people that have been fairly outspoken. And um, if we've seen something that we don't feel is okay, I guess because we've seen that modelled, we've we've been able to, to speak out to a certain extent. And do you think that, you know, for parents listening, do you think that that modelling is the best way to encourage your kids to grow up with that kind of mindset or do you think I mean it's that thing isn't it with with so much of parenting it's like kids copy what you do not necessarily what you tell them to do yeah absolutely and I think as well people ask a lot about you know how do I um talk to my children about race and how do I help them to understand and I and I always say it, it needs to start with you because if you, if you don't understand and if you haven't um, processed this, then it's going to be very difficult for you to explain it to your children. It's going to feel very hard for you to, to see things and to explain it to your children if you haven't actually done that yourself. So before... If you're in a place where you're not really sure what to say, then I would say take some time to actually read and listen and and learn yourself and then you'll feel more comfortable. Into, you know, you don't have to be an expert, but you definitely do need to to take that time to understand before you can start um, talking to your children about it. Yeah, and I think that your your Instagram account is a really good place to start, isn't it? I would say that, you know, you guys must spend a lot of time, you know, creating those posts that essentially are teaching people, you know, about the terms that, you know, are okay to use, what certain things mean, why certain things are unacceptable. So, uh, you know, along with, with you know, the Rennie Ezio Lodge book that you mentioned at the start, th- those are, I think, really good places to go to, to, you know, to really teach yourself, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, res- we always just say we're a real starting point. Like, if you're just not sure, then we've got book recommendations, we've got a whole... Um, resource list in our bio for children's books like there's then there's so many resources out there now like I mean Leila Saad's Me and White Supremacy is an amazing book to just if you're just not sure like where to start that's a great one because it's a 28 day guide to kind of take you through lots of the issues um, that you need to kind of think about um, so yeah, definitely understanding for yourself. And absolutely, it's about modeling. Um, because, you know, I've got two, two boys, um, four and a seven year old, and the, I see them and they mimic and copy things mm. that <laughs> I do and say. And I think, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> so yeah, they do. They pick up on things, but also that the other part of that is if, you send your children to to school, which most of us do, um, they're spending more time at school than they are with us, really. Which is terrifying. So <laughs> one of Yeah. <laughs> and so one of the things that I really drive and advocate for is finding out what's going on at your children's schools. Um, because I, I'm a teacher, I've been a teacher for Uh, 18 years and in state schools and I completely understand the challenges of being a teacher and I also understand um, the training that's involved and there is no statutory anti-racism training when it comes to um, teaching and safeguarding so really when we send our children to school we're just hoping that the school have undertaken something themselves or that you've got teachers that 
are confident and interested in those areas. And I think there's a lot of people that are the teachers that aren't confident in those areas. And so I, you know, always say to parents, um, you know, find out if, if your, um, if your local school have done any anti-racism training, like what are they doing to celebrate Black History Month? How can you help with resources? What are the books like that the children are bringing home? Because if our children are spending more time at school, then that's going to have a massive influence on. Hi, this is Melissa Clark from New York Times Cooking. Who doesn't love a simple one pan meal? Take my shakshuka with feta recipe, for instance. In a single skillet, you get perfectly cooked eggs nestled in a bright and fragrant tomato sauce surrounded by creamy nuggets of melted feta. It's a delicious breakfast, but it's just as good for dinner and it won't leave you with a lot of cleanup. You can find this recipe and all of our fan favorite one pan recipes at nytcooking.com. Them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's I think that's really important to be asking all those questions and not to be fobbed off. So if you get like a, you know, a, a letter back from or an email email back from the head teacher, you know, and you're a bit like, mm, this this doesn't sound like they're actually going to do anything, or it, this this doesn't feel satisfactory. To actually feel comfortable going back and asking more questions and yeah. pushing it a little bit. Absolutely, because it's not it's not just about our children. It's about all the other children as well, and it's about making sure that um, all the children are you know are safe and included. And I think it's a it's difficult because we know that schools are really under pressure and it's been such a tough few years and we know that teachers and support staff are working really hard. Um, but the thing is, you know, all children need to feel safe and included at school. And I know that certainly wasn't my experience when I was going to school. And that's why, you know, my mum had to come and advocate for us. And unfortunately, I don't think lots has changed when it comes to anti-racism and um, people talk about diversity and inclusion. That's different to anti-racism. So, yeah, I think that's something that we need to to keep pushing and moving forward. That's a really good point. I'd never thought that actually there's a very big difference. Um, my daughter's primary school has got a diversity and inclusion um, parent and teacher group. Um, but it had never occurred to me actually that that's that doesn't necessarily mean they're talking about anti-racism. No. That's actually two separate things. The other thing I was going to ask you about actually is a letter came out asking for you know parents to get involved. Mm. And I was really torn because I was like, this stuff matters to me. I'm really interested yes. in this. But do they really need a white mother coming <laughs> along and being part of that group? And then the other, and then I quickly thought, well, hang on a minute. We can't leave it to the, you know, the black, Asian, minority, ethnic yeah. um, parents to do all the work. So I was just in this kind of like limbo, kind of like, I don't know what the right thing to do is. I want to <laughs> help, but I don't want to, you know, wade on in being all patronising, like I can help yeah. when <laughs> I have no lived experience of this. Yeah, but I also think that you can, if you've been learning yourself, like you say, you don't want it to just fall on and um, people that already experience these things to have to then do all the legwork as well. So I think it's a, it's a balance. And you can also, if, you know, being part of a, a diversity and inclusion group or perhaps um, a parent forum, you can see where the gaps are. So if you go into that space and you know, and you, and you're looking around and you're thinking, right, everybody here <laughs> is, is white, white and everybody here is middle, middle class, class and able bodied. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, you know, it happens, and, right? Yeah. Actually, um, you know, maybe I need to, looking at why that is and how we can make sure that every other people are included in this group as well yeah yeah that's really, really good advice um so you and natalie um both work have worked with young people in your jobs um yeah so i'm guessing that there must be something in both of you that is really keen to support and help the next generation and you know yeah. th- th- it, it really comes across that you guys you know, you want to educate, you want to inform, you want to help. Is that is that true? Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. I think it can sometimes feel like everything is very overwhelming and 
if you're like, how can we make a difference? How can we change things so that it's not the same for our children? Um, and definitely after having the boys, one of my big things was I don't want them to have to experience the same things that I did. And so how how can we change that? And it's not about putting all the pressure onto young people because that's not fair. But I certainly think that that by helping to educate people, they can they can learn things differently because you don't know what you don't know. So if people don't don't learn the stuff that we didn't know, then how will how will it change? And often I think a lot of this stuff is just about people understanding. I don't I th- don't think there's many people that you can that you sit down and actually have a, a conversation with um, about, you know, for example, white privilege is one of those things where people are up in arms, you know, what white privilege, that's ridiculous. You know, this, I can't believe it. I'm not privileged. And then when you actually sit down and have the conversation about what it really means, there's not many people that then say, no, I still don't. There, A lot of people are like, oh, oh. It's interesting though, because I, I, I see it a lot. I see a lot of white people, that whole white fragility comes into play and you see them saying, no, no, but, but. And it's like, I, I see it a lot. I see people explaining really clearly, you know, um, you know, complex kind of issues around racism and white people are still not getting it still not yeah I think you know still I think so if we're talking about social media and if we're talking about sort of on television and things like that where it's ramped up but I think I'm talking about more on like a one-to-one like where you're chatting actually, to your friend or family member yes you're actually having a conversation that, of course, there are people that are just, ne- they're not interested, they're never going to listen, uh, etc. But I do think there are people that just, just need, just need it explained mm-hmm. in a way that isn't, um, where they don't feel threatened. Yes. Yeah. And they don't feel attacked. And I'm not saying that, you know, we have to kind of make everybody feel really like, oh, it's okay, and, like, <laughs> hold their hands. Yeah. And and certainly we shouldn't be putting um, people that experience racism in that position at all. But I do think that there are some people that just haven't had it explained to them in a certain way. Um, but certainly, yeah, social media is not, not the best forum to be doing that, I don't, you know, in comment sections and mm. things. Yeah, Um and you said earlier that, you know, we shouldn't be kind of shying away from having tricky conversations with our kids, whether it's about race or other social injustices. Um, I mean, how important is that? And, you know, is it a case of that we literally, you know, should we just be normalising these conversations so that it's just the stuff that we're talking about across the dinner table? Yeah, I think I think with children, it's really important not to shy away when they ask questions because obviously they do they they notice things and I think in the past you know it's been a case of people sort of don't say that you know that's rude and we shouldn't know you're too young to understand that and I think now we've realized perhaps that it's actually a lot healthier to have these open conversations you know, doing it in an appropriate way, obviously. But I do think one of the reasons we're in the place that we're in, or we got to the place that we're in, is because, particularly in this country, we've had this very sort of polite veneer, where we've been like, you know, we're such a, we, everybody's accepted, and we're a multicultural country, and, you know, but actually underneath, things haven't been like that because we haven't been talking honestly about how it really feels and so I think we do need to have those honest conversations I think children are much more um understanding than we give them credit for 
I've had a lot of conversations with my seven-year-old. Um, obviously, during lockdown, he saw um, all the things that were going on in the news and he saw what Natalie and I were doing and he was asking, like we went on marches and he was asking about Black Lives Matter and, you know, and we had a lot of, of open conversations and it was hard. It wasn't nice telling him about, you know, what, why black people have been treated differently and why things aren't fair, but he definitely got it, you know, and we've, and there's so many brilliant books out there and, and he's really interested and he's learned so much more than I did at his age. And I think it's going to stand him in really good stead um, when he's older. I think also in terms of developing empathy, we have to have these conversations because ultimately I think that's what I want for my children, for them to, they might not understand everybody's experiences, but they can certainly try and empathise with what goes on in other people's lives. And so to develop empathy, you've got to have those conversations. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, you mentioned going on marches um, with your son when we're talk- when we're you know talking about encouraging kids to care about the world around them and you know become activists how important is it to be getting out there and making noise do you think that we can be quiet activists at home or is it a case of no you've got to, you've got to get out there yeah i think there's all different ways that people can you know we often think about activists as as people who are being very public holding placards going on and all of those things are good you know and I think all of those things are important but there are people that are doing lots and lots behind the scenes and I think that I always say like use what you've got where you are and so whatever your gifts talents strengths are then turn those into something you can use for good. There are people that are amazing public speakers. There are people that are amazing writers. You know, there are people that are brilliant at organization and admin. And, you know, there's everybody's got different skills. Mm -hmm. And I think we need everybody to be, you know, part of, of change and we can all contribute in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And also thinking about, small acts of activism that I guess kids can get involved with so you know even if it's something like taking up issues you know with their school you know at their school with teachers whether it's yeah no hand soap in the toilets or you know a lack of variety in their PE lessons or whatever it is you know encouraging them to have that conversation and raise issues yeah absolutely and and our our children will all be interested in different areas and they will have things that particularly kind of affects their heart. And so, you know, I remember once um, driving past the seafront where we live with my son and he was talking about why people sleep on the streets. And he and we had a conversation about that. And he was um, before he went to bed, I could see like there was something wrong. And, and he was like, I just keep thinking about those people. And, and I said, right, okay, so what, what can we do then? Like, what can we do about that? Because I'm, it's important that we think about other people. And he was like, well, maybe, you know, people are cold. And I said, okay, so, so then let's find out what's going on in our area where we can help make sure that people aren't cold if they are sleeping on the streets. And so we had this whole conversation and it was led by him and what he felt impacted by and what had affected him. Um, and it went from there. And so I think, you know, we can be led by our children as well and help them to develop those skills. Like you say, to to have, you know, do small acts, but actually as they grow older, they realise that their small acts can make a difference. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, now, listen, tell me about your book, The Mixed Race Experience. It comes out in a few months, doesn't it? It does. It comes out in April. Um, we've just handed in the last draft. Mm. So 
it's such a good, <laughs> great relief before Christmas. I bet. Um, yeah, so we wrote it together um, and it's essentially a book that we were talking with one of our friends um, and he said to us, he's a bit of a mentor to us, and he said, are you going to write a book off the back of everyday racism and we were like oh we don't we don't know and there's so many brilliant anti-racism books out there I don't really feel like that's the right thing to do you know I think if you're going to write something you want to be adding to the conversation um and there's already so many brilliant books and he said but do you know the book that he's black and he's his wife is white and they've got mixed race children and he said do you know the book that I just I want is the book about um being mixed race I'm raising three mixed race children and I'm black and I I don't understand their experience and he was like that's the book you should write because that's your unique experience and we came away and we were we kind of thought about it and I said, oh, I don't know. I just, I don't know if it's the right time or, um, and Natalie was like, I just feel like this is the book that our parents needed. <laughs> and like, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So we talked about it and yeah. So that's the book we've written really. It's the book that we kind of wished we had growing up that we could have read that our parents and family could have read and so we've interviewed um lots of people because I think a lot of people think of being mixed race or biracial as um having one black parent and one white parent um and obviously that's not the case so we try to interview people with lots of different um heritages um so yeah sounds brilliant and I, I you know I, I know a few people that I'm already thinking right I'm gonna send them a link to this so they can pre-order it yeah. it just sounds <laughs> incredibly helpful um and yeah I'm sure it um touches on loads of issues and talking points that all the other books that talk about race probably don't so it sounds very much needed. So well done for, for writing that. Um, thank you. Listen, Naomi, thank you so much for joining me today. It has been so, so great to talk to you. And it's such a shame that uh, that we um, weren't able to catch up with Natalie as well. We'll have to do it again, Alison. Yes. <laughs> when the book comes out, we'll have uh, another yeah, chat. Yeah, we'll do another date. <laughs> um, where, where can we find you online to hear more, more brilliance from you? So our Instagram account is everyday racism underscore so at everyday racism underscore and then um we have a website which is just www.everydayracism.co.uk um so yeah you can find out more and on our instagram we have a, a bio link that's got some different resources on there that are free to download so we were talking about um schools and there's a free letter template um, that you can send to your local school and um, with some of the things that we were talking about that you can edit so yeah you can find us there and you've got a book club haven't you where you recommend yeah, some brilliant books we have yes i should yeah we have so we've got another um instagram account which is um the everyday racism book club um and we've got loads of uh, book recommendations on there as well um so yeah you can join the newsletter and join up to the book club and we'll be launching it again ready for um january so it could be a good new year's resolution you guys are you just so so busy i know it does sound <laughs> busy when i say all of that <laughs> so much going on oh my god well listen a heartfelt thank you for everything that you're doing because Aww. yeah like the education that you are putting out there the help the support it is so appreciated so thank you so much oh thanks Alison thank you for supporting us because you've been with us for a long time oh. <laughs> we appreciate that no worries <laughs> thank you very much for joining me it's been great take care bye at New York Times Cooking we believe that you shouldn't have to run to the grocery store every time you want to make something delicious 
I'm Melissa Clark, and my recipe for the most adaptable one-bowl cornmeal pound cake is a comforting loaf cake that you can have fresh out of the oven in under an hour using ingredients you probably already have on hand. And sliced, toasted, and buttered, it's practically a bread, so it gives you a pass to eat cake for breakfast. You can find so many easy, flexible pantry recipes like this one at nytcooking.com.